So we're going to look at some advice and guidance on building positive interactions. And we're going to start with building trust. As parents and carers, we all know that building positive interactions with our child's school will be beneficial to our children. Um, I hope to share my thoughts, advice and guidance on how to build those positive interactions. First and foremost, I say to all our new families that a foundation of trust is the first step to building positive interactions. So we may ask ourselves, how do we build trust? After all, our children are our top priority. And that's OK. We're handing over to a school with professionals we don't know yet. And it does feel like a big deal and it's perfectly normal for it to feel like a big deal. So what I say is be open and willing to build trust, get to know your school, build positive relationships with key staff that will be supporting your child. And if you can, be available wherever possible. So there are factors that will affect this, um, such as stage of education, uh, previous experience with schools and your ch child's learning needs. So if your child's going to school for the first time at age five, it will be a different experience to starting your secondary school as a natural transition into year seven, as it will be if your child has been uh, to a number of different schools or a mixture of mainstream dream and specialist provision. Or indeed, they're starting at sixth form or a college. Um, you're naturally more likely to be open and willing to build trust if your child is eager to attend, perhaps a little older, or you feel confident the school selected is the most appropriate setting for your child at a particular stage of their education. Um, now, previous experience with schools does play an important part of whether you will be willing to be open to build trust. If you've had a positive experience with a primary school, it might make you feel confident with a transfer to secondary. And you will maybe feel you can open and be willing to build trust. If you have a particular negative experience or have had a managed move or have lost confidence in a particular school's leadership or class teacher or perhaps a Senko in the past, this can understandably um, make you wary of being open to build trust. But if you can give it a go, it is worth being open at least. Um, your child's learning needs are key. So if your child does have a special educa educational need, you know, whatever your journey has been so far will impact on whether you feel you're able to build that trust. Um, as my area is special educational needs, I just wanted to acknowledge that depending um, where, where and what your journey looked like so far will impact on how confident you feel to be open and willing to build trust. Raising any child comes with challenges. And for those parents and carers with children with additional special educational needs, there may have been a significant challenge around diagnoses, whether for some it's accepting a specific learning difficulty, perhaps a disability such as autism, ADHD, or managing life at home. Access and appropriate health care can be tricky um, and indeed educational services. The journey is unique to that family, to that young person and can contribute to any anxiety around being open or willing to build trust with your school. It's important for you to feel confident. If your school has a holistic understanding of the learning needs of your child and be aware of their individual learning needs within the classroom, if you're confident your child's learning needs can be supported through high quality teaching, this will support you to be open and willing to build trust with your school. So what I always say is get to know your school before your child starts at the school. If you can, and they're offering one, attend an open day, read the website, um, on the Pontville School website and all the Witherslack Group School websites, there's a plethora of information um, before you do actually go along. You can have a look on there. Um, transition, ideal time for you to go. Um, and if not, arrange a visit 
prior to starting. But I would always say, find out as much as you can. So getting to know the school before your child actually attends. Um, the start of the journey here, we embraced the whole family at Pontville School. We work together to support the child in the best possible way. And every year we search for more ways we can work closely with parents and carers to give information and ensure we have a clear understanding what life looks like at home for the child so we can offer appropriate support. So building positive relationships with key staff. And um, you'll see a slide here where... Um, our head teacher had invited all of the special, uh, all of the senior leadership team um, to dress up on World Book Day. Um, all the parents had come along for an event on World Book Day, and it just lets them see the senior leadership team as human beings that they are, and that we can have um, a reciprocal relationship, and it's not all serious all of the time. So if you can, find out about the key members of staff and their role. Who is the leadership team? Who will be the head of year form? Um, who's your teaching assistants in the class? In Pomfit School and other with the Slack group schools, we will have family liaison officers. So who's the one that's assigned for your child? Um, what I would say following the communication policy, and we'll go into that a bit more um, later, um, it is important. Always say hello to the staff if you are picking up and dropping off. Um, and I say key be polite to the reception staff. You don't know when you're going to need them. Um, if you can, be available. We know that not all parents can be available. They work. You know, but if you can, for planned meetings and planned discussions, wherever possible, do make yourself available if you can. Being available will look different for everyone. If you can, as I say, this will increase your involvement in decision making for your child's education. Again, if you can attend progress evenings or parents evenings, it'll give you a valuable update on progress. It'll also help you improve your child's self-esteem. Knowing that you care about their education will be important to your child. It will support you to support child at home. Many parents and carers have other demands. That means it can be tricky attending parents' evening. So for most schools, they will be willing to arrange for you to speak to a member of staff for an update on your child's education at a time that's convenient to you. And if you can, try to attend events. If there's any parental involvement opportunities, join in. They can be fun. It's not always possible and it might not be your thing. Things such as school fairs, shows, um, they can be an opportunity to meet other parents as well. So if you can get involved, my message is if you can get involved, do. It will help the increased likelihood of positive outcomes for your child. There's been a lot of research done and one particular study um, by the Annie E. Casey Foundation found in their research the key to su student success was increased parental involvement. Now, I've got a lovely quote here from that study. So the extent to which schools nurture positive relationships with families and vice versa makes all the difference. And um, research shows this. Um, and there was this research, Key to Student Success in 2022, that shows students whose parents stay involved in school have better attendance, better behaviour, get better grades, demonstrate better social skills and adapt better to school. So what is parental involvement and how does it different from, differ from parental engagement? So parental involvement, this is the first step towards engagement. Um, it includes participation, as we were just talking about in school events or activities. And this is where the teachers providing learning resources um, and information about your child's progress. With involvement, teachers hold the primary responsibility for the educational goals. Now, I'll just give you a few examples um, of parental involvement. It's from as simple things as reading with your child, 
um, encouraging completion of homework if they are given homework. Now, we're not expecting that, you know, if they've got GCSE maths or physics homework, that you're going to complete the homework or help with the completion of homework. We're just encouraging them to do so. If there's issues around homework, do speak to your school just so that it's just not left. If you can, as we said, attend a parents or progress evening. Um, at Pumpfield School and all the Wither Slack Group schools, our children will have an educational health care plan and they'll have an annual review. It is really important, if you can, to work with your school to make sure that you can attend that and that your local authority can attend too. Now, lots of general advice is sent out from school. Um, I know that we send out regular general advice. Um, an example would be how to keep your child safe online. If you can, have a read. And if you've got any questions, ask school. Now, acknowledging positive achievements with your child, so important. This will help, again, build self-esteem. And if you listen to your child, if they express something that hasn't gone well, do feed it back to the school positively and then school can do something about it. I'm not saying when they get home, start pressing them for information. That can be a negative experience for a child. And certainly I know with my children on the autistic spectrum and for the children here at Pontville School, that isn't something you would press children for. However, it's nice to talk generally in the evening if it's around the dinner table um, or a certain point in the evening when you will be with your child and um, if they can say an uh, offload to you something that hasn't gone well speak to the school there might be a misunderstanding a miscommunication simple things that can be fixed and um, if you provide um, feedback Schools love this. Parental views, we have surveys, parent views, um, and we can use that for continual improvement. Um, all schools will welcome that from you, or if not, they should do. Um, if you read newsletters that sent, are sent out and any other information sent by the school, I know here at Popville School we use parent mail, um, and that is, is a valuable tool, and parents do like to receive those to keep them up to date. As I said, attend your open days, parents' evenings, assemblies, summer fairs, shows where you can. Just generally stay involved. So this is some of the activities at Pontville School. Um, so you'll be able to see that we have uh, run baking sessions where the parents come in and bake with their children. Um, I think this was a Christmas cookie, what particular one? Um, at Withers Slack Group School, we, we have uh, clinical services. Um, this is one of our um, occupational therapists delivering a session around sensory needs. And um, the central picture is about is a um, parent has come in and would, we've done um, a workshop in our art room and um, led by the art teacher. And that was a very successful event. Um, another one um, all around reading and how to help your child read at home. Um, and then another um, one. We, we have a small farm at Pontville School um, and you can see a parent has come in for one of the sessions um, and is helping feed one of the baby goats. So parental engagement and how does this differ from parental involvement? So teachers can offer advice, yet families and caregivers hold the most important information about their children. Teachers don't always know all of this information about the child because they're not in the home. They don't see what day to day life is like for you as a family. And schools should always consider and I know parents and carers are experts on their child. Your child's learning experience is improved when both work together. Engagement is where home and school work together in partnership, empowering parents by providing them with ways to participate hearing them as an important voice in the school and removing any of those barriers to engagement. So some examples I have there of parent engagement. 
and um, this is one of our uh, parent voice sessions um in the picture and um, where we've got our um head teacher Hayley Dorian um handing over from um our previous head teacher so you could attend educational workshops if they're covering something that you're not sure about go along and see what your child is covering in school Anything that would support, if you sent information home to read, anything that will support your child's maths, anything that will support their educational outcomes, read the information, keep yourself informed. And also problem solving with staff. Try and find solutions to current issues. For example, if your child's reluctant to engage in a particular lesson, arrange a meeting, go in or speak on the phone. We'll have a virtual meeting, work with the staff to problem solve. This will improve the outcome for your child. The better the partnership between school and home, the better the school and the higher the student degree achievement across the board. So you as parents and carers hold the key to developing children's lifelong love of learning. You can create a home environment that encourages learning, communicate reasonable but aspirational expectations for achievements and stay involved with your child's education. So what I'm saying is working as a team, when you have a strong and respectful partnership with your child's school and the teachers, you're in a really good position to give them information to help your child get the most out of education. So treat yourselves as a team. You and your child's teachers can work together to support learning, development and well-being. When everybody's working together in the best interests of your child, it is likely to have a positive your child is likely to have a positive attitude towards school and also experience other benefits. So if you do need a meeting or a conversation about a matter you would like to raise with your child's school, I always say think before the meeting. So before you make contact with the school, make a list of key points. Be clear on the purpose of your communication. Ask yourself, what's the outcome you want? Consider, is it reasonable? So what you, you've thought and what you've considered, is it reasonable? If your feelings are running high, maybe it's sensible to wait. Give yourself some time to think, reflect on it, on what you actually want from the communication from the school. So my positive tips to aim for effective interactions to find the best way forward. When you do make communication, allow the school time to respond. School leaders and teachers are usually balancing many competing demands on their time. It's also OK to advise the school what time, what date works best for you to fit into your life. So when you want to have a conversation or meeting, you really don't want to feel rushed or stressed. Always keep your communication clear and succinct. It's good to acknowledge the school's busy, but that you'd appreciate acknowledgement that they've actually received your communication. How many times do you send an email but don't get anything back and just want that reassurance that there's been safe receipt at the other end? You could ask for safe receipt of your communication and ask for an indication of when you're likely to hear back. That's good communication. State what you'd like to see as the desired outcome of the matter. What are your expectations? And share them constructively and respectfully. Advise the school regarding best times to contact you and state your preferred method of communication. Do you want a face-to-face -face meeting? Would you like a phone call? Does it SMS, email or what is needed um, to meet your needs? So what I am going to do is talk about parent self-care. We've been talking about our young people. 
and we've been talking about how getting the best outcomes for them is working with your school and communication is the key to success. Partnership and team working, parental involvement and engagement are so important. But in order to put your energy into creating positive outcomes for your children, you do need to look after yourself. And how many of us hear this? And how many of us don't look after ourselves? So you may have seen this before, but I do use it. The stress bucket. How many of life's stresses are getting thrown in to what is not being balanced by you taking time out? We all know life is a balancing act, but we need to get that stress and rest and relaxation even. So what would time out look like to you? Do you get time to go for a walk, even if it's just walking the dog? Do you get 10 minutes to read a book before you go to sleep? Do you have the luxury of taking a bath, a lighting a candle, putting on some tunes that you like? Do you get time to spend with your friends? All of those inject well-being back into yourself and help you cope with the stress that's coming into that bucket. I always remember 19 years ago when my son was diagnosed, somebody said to me, taking 30 seconds on the sofa is better than not taking any time for yourself. And I've lived by that mantra and I take my 30 seconds and they're really important. Are you into things like mindfulness or yoga? These are things that can really help bring the balance and well-being into your life. The impact is if we don't do these things, that we can be negatively impacted. So why is it important to incorporate self-care into our daily routine? Burning the candle at both ends can come with consequences. This can include burnout. Hopefully, you know, that is something that you don't get to. But it can include depression, anxiety, resentment, and a whole host of other negative implications. But engaging in a self-care routine, it's actually been clinically proven to reduce stress, improve concentration, minimise frustration, also those feelings of anger, increase happiness, improve our energy and more. So from a physical health perspective, self-care has been clinically proven to reduce medical issues. So do support yourself. Now, one very important thing that I just want to touch on is about asking for help. If you need help, ask your school for help. They are often holding a wealth of knowledge. I certainly know a senior family liaison here at Pontville School that we have lots of information that benefits our families, whether it's information on sleep, early help, support in your local community. The correct support that you need may just be a phone call away. So do mention if you need help to your school and they will be willing to signpost you to the correct services. I think it's just something that parents and carers don't generally think of. But actually, your school is there to offer that wide range of support for you. So i have just coming to the end of the presentation and I would just like to say thank you for listening. And I'll just hang back over to Molly Chell.
Oh, thanks, Sarah. That was brilliant. Thank you so much for the, um, there's lots of useful advice in there. I've just got a few questions to ask. I think there's three. So the first one that I found was, how do I get my child's teacher on board with movement breaks? My son has ADHD and struggles with focus and attention, but their reason for not letting him have his movement breaks is because it disrupts other kids. Any advice? Welcome. So movement breaks we know for children um, with neurodiversity, particularly ADHD, very important that that is incorporated um, throughout the day. Now, if a teacher is reluctant, um, this can be mainstream or any school, um, if it's built into a plan for a young person and staff in the classroom are aware, you as a parent can say, look, um, we have evidence that from a medical practitioner or from an occupational therapist that our child with his ADHD, with her ADHD, needs those movement breaks. You will see an improvement if you provide those movement breaks. Give it a go. Um, now, the teacher really, um, you know, you wouldn't have want to wait to an annual review for that. You would just want to make a planned meeting, have your questions sent in in advance, have some evidence with you, and it doesn't have to disrupt other children in the class. It can be incorporated at, for all of the children if they need to get the wiggles out. And, you know, you can do that as one method. Um, another method can be that they have their own um, card that they hold up. Um, they might want to just do a sign. So put the pencil at the front of their um, table and then somebody knows just to give them uh, that they need to slip out of class. There's lots of discrete ways that a young person can go and take a movement break without it disrupting um, the, all of the other children in the class. Um, it's hard for me because with the Slack Group Schools, we incorporate movement breaks as an essential part um, of children's programme for the day. But for other parents that are struggling with teachers, don't give up because that is a vital part of keeping your child regulated um, and will contribute to positive outcomes, certainly um, for the teacher and for them. Because once they see that they are self-regulated after a movement break, they will improve their concentration and focus and be able to get on with their work. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, that was a brilliant answer. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, the next question is, due to my foster son's previous school experience, he has little to no trust in teachers and most adults. He's currently out of education. And while I'm keen for him to go back to school, I feel for him and want him to feel confident on his return. How can I work with his new school to make this a better experience for him? We always say if a child's been out of education for a period of time, that it is um, quite overwhelming for the parent and obviously the young person to make those new steps back in so we always say make small steps break it down into tiny chunks and um, meet with the without the child meet with the school or have a telephone conversation um, or a virtual meet and whatever works for you talk through the needs of your child um, and then plan a really good transition plan where the young person can go in, maybe have a look around an empty school where there's no other pressures or demands on them. Um, whatever would meet you, the parent would know the child best in the sense of what they think would work. And um, so by all means, tell the school what you think would work and build a transition where you might start a morning, morning to after lunch um, before you do a full day. Um, there's lots and lots of um, resources on the With Slack group um, website um, that will help you with anything to do with um, starting your child um, back to school. Um, but when you've had a big gap back to school, it can be a challenge um, and you're not the only one. We have lots of children starting in With the Slack group schools here at Pompville School as well that have had a, a, a time out of school. If they have had some trauma in a previous school, um, it is definitely worth um, looking at. Um, do they need some support um, around that as well when they do arrive at school? Um, and do they need, you know, somebody that they can check in with daily? Um, that might be something that you want to um, build into 
their transition in going into school. Is that yeah, okay? That, yeah, that's great. Thank you, Sarah. And then the final question we've got is, my daughter focuses and achieves fan fantastically in school. However, getting her engaged with homework is a different story. I think this is due to her masking in lessons and by the time she's home, she's exhausted. I don't want to push her, but is there anything that the school can do to support either in school or when it comes to providing this homework? So homework can be a contentious issue for parents. We always understand this um, and the demands on children are high during the day, particularly if a child is masking. However, um, we know that to get good outcomes that we do need to give that little bit of encouragement. However, we need to find a time that we can meet with school and understand how can we break that homework down into something that the young person is going to engage with. Can we deliver it in a different way? So is there something online that might be um, a special interest for them? Um, is there something that, that, that they have that they would like to um, bring into school? Um, I'd certainly know some young people, if they would complete in a piece of English work, it might not necessarily have to be on the work that has been set in the class, but on something that the young person has an interest in, but is still meeting the requirements of the homework, just to remove that stress while they get back into the habit of doing homework. And um, there's always a way to find, um, and if, if homework's just not going to work for this young person, Mum and school, parents and school need to find a way around that. Are the times in school when we can cover that extra work um, where, and then home, home time is where there is no homework. And even if that's just for a short period of time to help the child settle, um, you know, that can that can give a breather and a break um, to homework and remove the pressure and the demand. And then we can go back to it and put it into small steps and it not be overwhelming for the young person or the family. Because the last thing you want is a young person coming home and then exhausting themselves after a very, very busy day um, with the emotion around not wanting to do homework. Yeah, 